et cetera, and even Notion, you'll notice that you create your own content for these uh, services. Basically, you're the creator, and it's your data for a lot of these services. And I think these categories of consumer-facing applications, we're all looking for those uh, use cases for you know, consumer applications in Web3. I think these are actually the ripest categories for you to take more control over your data. Um, single player Uber is not fun because you just get into your car and drive somewhere, right? You, need, you actually need more players for Uber to be fun, right? So basically, this category of applications, though, there's no reason why you can't just have your own instance and federate outwards. And we're going to be talking about a lot of the technicals on how this is possible. Today, with signing with Ethereum and some of the exciting decentralized identity technology coming out of the ecosystem. So most of these central services are built like this. The only thing that is user-owned is kind of the hardware, right? Your phone or your laptop or something. And then you log into you know, the services using logins that you don't control, right? Because you use probably an identity provider or something else. And uh, basically, um, you have the login, the backend server you know, hosted on the company's AWS or whatever. You have the database, RDS, Postgres, MySQL, whatever. And then you have the domain, too. The cert's kind of all controlled uh, you know, by that company, or IANA, depending on you know, how much you care about correctness in that. But uh, basically, we have a lot of similar things in Web3 that could kind of be tit for tat in each of these, right? So even domains, like we've seen ENS, and with the LTU scalability, you can start chipping away at those DNS use cases, although DNS is still great. Um, databases, we'll get into how we can do that. Login, we have sign in with Ethereum. And even uh, the servers will have these uh, data vault servers. Like, servers are kind of replaced by dApps in Web3 today, but we'll see how they're connected. And dApps today, as you probably know as dApp builders, they kind of look like this. Uh, again, the user owned is the hardware and the keys, right? So you get the keys too. And what's cool about the backends for blockchains is how dApps can be built today, not all of them are, is that they can be static code, single page apps that you can just load and use, right? And then the blockchain itself is immutable and stuff can get written there. So um, we have this idea at Spruce about unbundling the login, where instead of basically one or two login providers controlling the end-to-end -end user experience, users define their end-to-end -end experience and they can pull in the right resources that they want for their session whether it's you know, places to persist data, whether it's data vaults to get, delegate access to data, et cetera, there's an emerging ecosystem of all these unbundling the login areas. And basically, uh, this will give users new degrees of freedom in terms of what they can do with their keys, not just create transactions to Ethereum, but a whole suite of other things that can be complementary to that or just totally independent. And uh, sign in with Ethereum gives us this passwordless login, which basically allows us to recognize a message as the login request, right? So um, this is probably going to come out in future versions of wallets, being able to see this interface and know that you're logging in, you're not getting man in the middle attacked, et cetera, and then you're able to do your stuff, right? But that's just regular login, right? Can we go further? Can we do more? And I think the answer is yes. We can do things with more keys. Why do we sign things in the first place? We want to do an action such as authenticate, authorize, but we want to execute that action with guarantees about integrity of the message and authenticity that, you know, someone who signed it. And the more we sign things, the more opportunity we have for user control. That's digital empowerment because today you can sign things in the physical world. When we're in the digital world, it's not clear that you can do that. You might have to you know, designate a service to do that for you. So the more that you sign stuff digitally, the more empowered you are to do stuff, especially if there are more systems recognizing your signing, right? Today it's Ethereum, maybe it's pass keys with certain websites, but more and more you can get more control that way. Uh, key recovery, multi-sigs, that's a whole other rabbit hole. But the problem today with Web3 wallets and doing this is that every time, let's say we wanted to do like decentralized Dropbox, right? And every time you needed to like rename a file or drag it around, you had to like get this prompt up and it's stuff that you don't understand, right? The UX is pretty bad and uh, just going through a normal interaction is terrible. So um, that is not acceptable for, you know, Web2 competitive UX. To get there, we want to delegate some authority, not all of it, but some authority to another key kept in a more, place, more convenient place but less secure. 
So we narrow the scope of what that key can do, right? And then that key can be used to take actions without all these confirmation dialogues. But if it gets compromised, the scope of damage is limited. It's not like compromising your master seed phrase. So we think that this is going to result in huge UX improvements and a bunch of dimensionality in terms of what your keys can ultimately do. So you can execute with this many actions, just one signing to delegate the key in as many as you want, right? So long as the key is within the validity period. Where does the key live? Because you really attenuate the permissions, you can even keep it in the DOM, right? Because that's kind of where cookies live, more or less. And this is effectively replacing the cookie by your signing, delegate signing. So basically, um, the actual implementation of this uses something called cacaos, uh, which is a chain agnostic capability objects um, that are just a summary of a sign in with a theory message. Seabor encoded, I think. Um, and it's just super compact. So you're able to basically delegate to a session key, like a new did key or a did PKH or something. And then that key can be empowered to do things. And there are other protocols that we work on, like recaps that allow you to uh, that specify what those permissions are. So other great things you can do with keys, now that you, you know, figured out how to spawn them or maybe the wallet has native support, you can basically issue content credentials. And this is how we unlock decentralized social media because you can sign a statement saying that you tweeted this or you follow someone, and within that credential you issue, you can point to a revocation list somewhere you control that you can use to unfollow someone. And when someone tries to present the proof of your follow, it's no longer valid, right? So that control stays with you and your keys because that's the issuer. So as a user, we need to get used to thinking about ourselves as issuers instead of just these authorities that have traditionally been doing issuance like platforms, right? So I think that's going to usher in decentralized social media, a lot of these use cases, et cetera, these peer-to-peer -peer attestations. So um, reviews are interesting too, and I'll get to that. That's our example later today. And another thing you can do with keys is you can send messages end-to-end -end encrypted, right? You can basically encrypt to someone's Ethereum address or a key that they designate as their encryption key, and um, that, that is secure message integrity communication that you can send something like a credential maybe. And another interesting idea to consider are data licenses. Basically being able to issue the right for someone to use your data for a certain period and then revoke that right if you want to, right? If you can cryptographically sign something then, and there's a framework to interpret those data, then you can make data licenses all the same. So keys equals empowerment, right? So I think that the grand scheme of this is instead of this front end, back end server, you know, database model, what we're able to do is we are able to actually get a DAP and you can go from the DAP with session keys and other things to a variety of services that all respect your keys, not just blockchains that expect you to make transactions. And that can produce these hybrid applications that just have phenomenal UX as good as Web2, right? Or better too, because you have the finality of the blockchain behind you for the transactions you care about, right? So I think this is extremely exciting. I'll go through some of these technologies that will make it possible. And the other thing is that, um, if you can choose your indexer service, right, and other things like that, you actually don't have to rely on, like, for example, the back end that the DAP company hosts to do the indexing, right? You can pick your own indexer, you get a lot more freedom that way, and the DAP really just becomes static. Like, if you host it on an ENS name, for example, and that code is, like, hash referenced, like, nothing else changes. That is as, a, you know, static app as you can get, right? You can carve that code into stone and, like, read it again, and it would still work. Um, there's no dynamic aspects of it, so it's trustless. So how do we actually like get to personal data vaults where you can store stuff like reviews and credentials? Uh, there's quite a bit of technology to work on in these stacks, uh, but I think that um, it all starts with key-based direct authentication, as we saw with uh, signing in with Ethereum and unbundling the login. Now, um, it's kind of like in Finding Nemo, like, you know, fish are friends, well, keys are friends, so long as they are cryptographically secure and they can do things and the user can custody them relatively well, then keys are friends, right? Like, why do we, you know, don't discriminate against different curves and hashing algorithms if they're okay? Um, you know, maybe we will when we move to post-quantum, but we're not there yet. So, um, and then also we can uh, delegate using these keys capabilities. You're able to make permission slips with keys and sign them off as if you were the teacher in the middle school, right? Isn't that awesome? And then like those rights can be taken by an agent, maybe accessing your data vault or the high school bathroom or whatever, and they can demonstrate that to the resource and be designated access, right? 
that's a new security model that is possible when people have keys. Um, the only thing I found close to that was in like, I think the early 2000s, Matt Blaze, who teaches cryptography at JHU, he, uh, he had a system called Keynote, not the Apple software, but like it was like an RFC at IETF. Go look it up, right? And he had this like predicate system that you would sign off on. Very similar, but it, it expected PKI to be prevalent, and we didn't have that then. Now we have this thriving community of people with keys in their wallets, and also builders who want to like enable these use cases, right? That's kind of the difference that I see between like the signing with Ethereum community and like the WebAuthn community. There are so many like DApp builders using signing with Ethereum and doing cool stuff and wanting to do more. How many WebAuthn verifier builders are there? There's like eight, you know, like it's like basically the folks who build the libraries and then everyone uses those libraries and that's kind of it. So it's like, okay, great, there's like massive scale, but how agile is the software? How much agility is there, right? And then I think transitioning to provenance models based on interoperable data models is going to be really groundbreaking as well. Today, the root of trust is in like a cluster of Postgres databases, right? And uh, what if we transition to cryptographically signed messages as the root of trust, right, instead of in a database? There is no integrity in that mode in most databases, uh, you know, that are SQL, MongoDB, whatever. They may be web scale, but, you know, they don't necessarily have cryptographic attestation every step along the way, right? So switching to these models where the provenance is signed off for, issued, you know, and the data are certificates or credentials, that's a really interesting model to me. Previously, there was an implicit trust that it came from a trusted domain as a de facto issuer, right? So if you think about this model, where actually it's like a little data container that's signed off with its own bill of lading, right? And we get to the data supply chain, and you know where the data came from and everything. That is actually a really compelling route of trust because it's interoperable, especially if you extend things with linked data and the like, right, and IPLD. Um, I think it's an exciting direction because, again, this is how we get to the, the decentralized social media future where you can make a tweet and that data packet you sign off on, that's authoritative. Not the entry in the database of the tweet host website, right, but the thing that you cryptographically signed off on and also the revocation list that you control somewhere. Maybe in an L2 smart contract and you can revoke it there. Maybe it's in your data vault, you know, as is low recursive, but we'll, you know, you, you'll see. Um, and then data federation protocols are super exciting too. A lot of the groundwork has been done by IPFS, libp2p, bitswap, those kinds of algorithms. But you know, we had tip to the old school stuff too, ActivityPub, BitTorrent, SCP. I always thought BitTorrent was funny compared to blockchain because in, um, basically in blockchain you're fitting a lot of different transactions into a block. But in uh, BitTorrent you're fitting a lot of blocks into like one transaction, right? So yes, no, okay, well. That joke um, sometimes works. Uh, so, uh, and SCP is awesome too. Um, so let's go into a little example, um, you know, inspired by Snow Crash. I think that we should just, in the decentralized uh, community, use Snow Crash pizza delivery as probably the root example of things. But anyway, let's talk about decentralized Yelp. Um, if you, you know, work with me, I've probably been talking your ear off about this idea, so I'm grateful to do it in a broader basis and, you know, get it out. So basically, um, why does like, uh, you know, Yelp, like if you're writing reviews that are private for your Yelp account, why do those have to like be with the online service you don't control, right? That, uh, back to the first slide, like, you know, that's like one of those services that maybe you should sign off on and then you can control how the data are shared further, et cetera, right? And um, I think that's exactly how it should work. You know, you get your own planet um, and uh, you're able to commit your pizza reviews or whatever to there or, you know, this is exactly how Mastodon can work today, right? So very similar architecturally, but we describe some specific technologies that can help us get there. And then you can federate out. You can issue data licenses to share with other people's planets, right? And, like, build your constellation. And uh, you and your friends can share reviews uh, and federate it outwards. This is what I mean by single player ready, right? Because you can write, like, the most scathing, awful reviews you want to and get it out there in your own personal space or drafts or whatever. You know, think about for medical histories and other directions. Like, it's not just reviews, it's a lot of things that should be single player friendly or ready, right? And then from there, you can even have, like, you know, recursive data licenses that allow 
this network to even share it further, right? Maybe like you belong to, I don't know, a DAO and you all federated your reviews. So the DAO has like its pizza places that it likes. And then that DAO works with a few other DAOs. And now we have DAO coverage across the world for the pizza places are actually good. And then one DAO makes like bad decisions and they think that Chicago deep dish is good and they get like ejected from the network, you know, from like the meta DAO, right? Like that, that's the architecture that's possible if you're able to use the end-to-end -end protocols that we talk about. So that's a little bit about single player ready dApps and you know, I know uh, it's the last session of the day here so I really appreciate everyone hanging through this. Um, hopefully you found it interesting in some of the technologies that uh, we're working on at Spruce, really try to cover this. Um, and I think that uh, last slide that I wanna talk about is um, if you care about data ownership, right? Uh, and like just being able to control stuff that is in your digital life, if you grew up like, you know, after like the late 80s or something, you probably spent a lot of your time on the internet as a kid. So that means that a lot of your identity is actually like affected digitally because that's where you spent your time, right? So like when, when you get a data incursion, you didn't expect that, you're probably like very emotionally affected. Like that was a total, you know, that wasn't okay. Whereas like, you know, other generations may be like their relationship with the internet, um, you know, on the average might be, using Facebook or something, right? So you might have a different view on it. Anyway, so digress about like, uh, and I'm sure there are lots of other demogra cross demographic things I won't get into because that's not the point of this talk, but you might have found yourself interested in these self-hosted like things, right? Like why am I, you know, uploading all my pictures to iCloud even though it is the most convenient and great thing? I don't know, there's something interesting about not like that's like a different company or something, right? What degree of control do you feel over that? the reviews you write, you know, um, stuff you back up, all the things in your life. So you might have gone the rabbit hole and like, oh, what if I were to run my own server, right? And then I would host things on it. And you might have found that it's like a lot of steps and also a lot of things that can go wrong. Like you didn't upgrade TLS and then Heartbleed came out and now you're nuked and all this other shit, right? So basically a lot of these are like systemic challenges that you as even someone who want to run your own planet and you know, data vault, you have to run this over and over again. The PHP version is matching up with the software that needs to maintaining, et cetera. And the implementer for these apps, they have big challenges too. Every single time you get one of these like photo storage like apps written in PHP from the early 2000s, they had to implement authentication themselves. And if you like scale this across 100 applications, I guarantee you someone did that wrong, right? So um, basically the replication of it, okay, we got it running on one server, your NAS or something, right? How do you like replicate it? Can you just like download a zip of it and that's it? Or can we do like a nice CRDT replication across multiple instances? Well, no one self-hosted project, you know, can have the engineering power necessarily to do that. So. I think that these are all, and like even sharing it out, right? Like generating a share link and making sure it's secure and expires on time. These are like cross-cutting horizontal functionality that protocols can solve really well. So when someone gets an idea to build one of these self-hosting apps, right, or single player ready apps, they can build on this basis of open protocols already that bring them almost there to the security side and a bunch of other things. And then they can really focus on making the UX beautiful for the user and really usable or making sure the app experience isn't like garbage because ten, when you have to build all this stuff on the back end, how much time can you actually spend making the app nice if that's how people use it, right? So I think if we can work as an ecosystem and solve a lot of these problems at the protocol level and use a lot of open source, we might make self-hosting cool again and fun, right? And I think th that's the future that I would really like to live in. So thanks for listening to my talk, everyone, and uh, feel free to chat with me after.